What About Vietnam? A podcast with Gary Newsom. The series where Gary talks with travellers about their experiences and adventures. Find out more about Vietnam from the people who have actually been there. What about Vietnam? Whether it's adventure, exploring the culture and cuisine, shopping, or just soaking up the sun. Let Carrie and her travellers pave the way for a magical holiday in Vietnam. What about Vietnam? Xin Chow and welcome to What About Vietnam. I'm very excited about today's program because it's not often that I get somebody as talented and as gifted in the art of cooking as my guest today, Chef Tracy Lister. I'm going to give you a little bit of background to her because uh, she has a, a long history uh, having lived in Vietnam and she's been part of some very interesting uh, growth areas in the area of cooking classes, etc. And I just think she will bring a lot to the program. We're going to be talking about cooking classes, which is a really fun thing to do in Vietnam and a great way to learn about the country uh, and the culture of the country through its food. So about Tracy, Tracy has, as I said, been going back and forth uh, to Vietnam for over 20 years. She did actually live in Hanoi back in 2008. She's a well-published author. Uh, A Culinary Journey Through Vietnam was released with her husband back in 2008, sold over 9,000 copies around Australia, Japan, UK and USA. Uh, She brought out a second book in 2011 uh, called Vietnamese Street Food, uh, and that's been translated into German and Finnish. And uh, her most recent book in 2017 called Real Vietnamese Cooking um, and Made in Vietnam came out then and is a really great third edition to her list of uh, writings. She is uh, currently now based in Australia, in Melbourne, and she has opened up her own restaurant uh, and cooking school called Brunswick Kitchen. Uh, I really suggest if you come to Australia or you live in Melbourne or you live in Australia and you get a chance to visit, that uh, you get onto the website. I'll put the link in the notes. It's a fantastic opportunity for you to learn the art of cooking Vietnamese food, uh, but also, you know, extends to the art of even making your own gnocchi. So there's lots of opportunities for learnings there. Just to end off uh, some history on Tracy, uh, she was very instrumental in forming uh, Koto. uh, And Koto is a a grassroots charity uh, and restaurant, actually, that helps street kids to free themselves from the poverty cycle through vocational training. I've been to the restaurant several times over the years. Uh, It's a fantastic uh, project. She was a major contributor to the training aspect of of these kids to make it what it is. And it is a great culinary experience. If you do get to visit uh, Hanoi, I suggest that you definitely go to the Koto restaurant. I hope you're going to enjoy this episode. Tracy has a lot to offer and to to give you in advice in in choosing a cooking class to attend, what you can expect to get from the class and um, just, you know, all all of the stuff that you would come to expect on this show. Uh, Let's welcome Tracy to the program. If I sound a bit excited, um, I am. Tracy, welcome to the show. We're going to talk cooking, one of my most favourite things to do in Vietnam. How are you? Hi, Kerry. I'm great. Thanks very much. And yes, talking about Vietnamese food is one of my favourite things too. Okay. Look, one of the things that uh, it you know does come up on a tour to Vietnam is definitely the option for people to do cooking classes. Mm. So. 
what in your experience, and considering you've been at the front of the room mostly of late uh, doing cooking classes, I mean, what can a person expect to get out of a class? I mean, I'm taking into consideration that, you know, not everyone's into cooking and sometimes, you know, if a couple uh, traveling to Vietnam, maybe the guy's not that interested. So what would you, what would you say to that? Okay, well, I think doing a cooking class in Vietnam is, well, you will walk away with it being one of the highlights. Even the people that don't want to do it end up totally enjoying it because it's, I mean, the food is fantastic, but it's so much more than the food. It's really about the the culture and traditions associated with that. Most cooking schools will take you to the market and the market is, the, the, the soul of the Vietnamese community, you know, you go there to find out the latest news and what's happening and it's busy and it's vibrant and um, it's, just, it's just a fabulous experience. And even if you're not really into the cooking side of things, you do get to eat some delicious food afterwards. And it's, it's got a, there's a character that, that goes with the cooking class itself because I think if you take into consideration things like the location of the school, mm-hmm. you know, there's always something of value to that, like the actual, if it's a restaurant, it's usually got some history to it. Uh, then the person who gives the class, I've met some fabulous people who are actually at the front of the room and delivering the class. So you learn something from them. And then a lot of them, as you say, don't uh, just minimise it to, you know, chopping, cutting and cooking. There's, it's, it's usually about a half-day event, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's correct. And so, particularly if you're going to the market as well. Um, I think what you need to do is... Do them everywhere you go because food in Vietnam is very regional and, as you say, there's all different characters but there's all those wonderful regional differences. So if you do, you know, do a class in Saigon, do one in uh, Hoi An where there are plenty of cooking classes, but don't forget Hue. I mean, Hue has amazing royal cuisine, has rich uh, vegan uh, history and, and culinary traditions because of all the pagodas there have been the old uh, imperial city. And then you've got Hanoi food. And then even when you go up north into around Sapa and around the Chinese border, the cuisine changes again. So um, do them where you go, I think, and just make sure that when you're doing a class that you're not repeating the same thing. So, you know, if they're doing banana flower salad in Hoya, you don't really want to be doing anything in Hanoi. No, it's a pretty popular dish and they do drag that one out uh, quite often. I agree with you. Mm. So walk us through just just roughly what a, a, a tour would include from like start to finish. What, well, when, what, yeah. what would it typically include? Okay, well, generally a welcome, an introduction to um, Vietnamese food bit of advice about how to navigate the streets and the market before you before you head out. Um, I would spend probably a good 45 minutes to an hour at the market. It might seem like a lot, but it is such an exciting place um, and it is so different to what we're used to here. Like I would walk in, you know, talk about rice, the importance of rice, the importance of fish sauce, into the market, um, looking at all the various eggs, um, including, of course, the fertilised egg, and uh, and then there'd be a lady selling beetle leaf, which is a, a narcotic that uh, older uh, women generally chew in Vietnam. So it just gives you a nice little buzz and relaxes your limbs as you get older. And, um, and uh, then there, there's somebody selling all the votives. So for a funeral or paying respects at the altar to your ancestors, you, you can um, purchase your votives there and that can be anything from uh, a nice new dress or a sewing machine or a motorbike. Um, it's, you know, whatever you want you can have made into a votive. And then you wander down and you've got all your... Um, meat products, 
and they're generally coming in twice a day. So you go into these markets, there's no refrigeration, there's no hot running water, but there's no odour. They are so clean and that's because the women, and it is mainly women, work really hard to keep clean. So they're scrubbing, cleaning constantly. Uh, a, a busy market will have two kills a day so the, so the meat's killed in the morning and that's for lunch. That's all gone by 11.30, 12 o'clock for lunch. Ladies have a siesta and then it's back on again at 3 o'clock with a fresh kill. So, you know, you walk through, no odour, go down the back of the market, that's where you're going to find your uh, your frogs. So people <laughs> are being very efficient at um, dispatching frogs and, uh, and your eels and your clams and your live fish and your live prawns, and then I'd loop back around and go through all the amazing produce um, including a woman that would be selling bouquets for hair washing. So she was your, your, your pharmacist basically. So she could um, put a little bouquet together for you to wash your hair and beautiful aromas from that. But, you know, if you've got a bit of a skid allergy or, you know, you're feeling a bit tired, you've got a headache, she could put together something for you that you could bathe in or drink or, or whatever. Yeah. Wow. And that's in a very small space, about, probably about a quarter of the size of your average big chain supermarket here. Hmm. And I think all that fresh produce that you mention, I can remember in very early days when I took uh, someone to the markets, uh, because of the no refrigeration, because of the space elements and because it is in normal circumstances, kind of open and out there, isn't it? It's yeah. on big tables. It's yeah. kind of, as you say, the meat is freshly chopped and cut in front of you. You know, there's eels jumping around in a plastic tub and crabs in, you know, the mm. similar kind of circumstance. So for me, and and certainly for people, for people that have never seen that, that that's in that that is a little bit in your face, isn't it? It, it can be very confronting, and I have had people that uh, have had to leave the tour. Yes. So I'll, uh, I'll I'll always have someone with me, and they would take that person back, but not not often. You know, maybe in ten years, maybe five people have had to go back because you've got the humidity and all that sort of stuff as well. Yes, I tend to give warnings. So, you know, as we're coming up to where they're chopping the heads off frogs, I'll say, okay, if you don't want to see that, you go this way. Mm. The rest of us will walk around the other way. Same with um, uh, the, the fish. They're not killing chickens in the market anymore um, since the bird flu and the pork's all killed at, a, at an abattoir and comes in. But it comes in as a, as a dead pig, you know, and, and in the mm. West... We're used to very sanitised fillets and no bones and we have got so far removed from what we're actually eating. We don't even have to acknowledge that it's a dead animal. And I, you know, I really, I, I, just, I think the Vietnamese approach is much better. Um, there is no wastage. You know, we're, they're not squeamish about having the blood of the duck or um, or any of the organs. In fact, they're all the best bits and the bits that would go first uh, for staff meals. But it's, you know, it, we don't see that in the West. And I, I do like no. the idea of eating the entire animal. Like if you're going, if, I totally understand being a vegetarian or a vegan, but if you're going to eat animal, you need to acknowledge where it comes from and you should also eat the whole thing and not have the wastage that we have here in the West. Yeah, and I think that's where some of the education fact comes in for me. One of the things that I learned very early on was the the, uh, the way that they would make use of absolutely everything, whether mm -hmm. that's uh, a plant, whether that's uh, a vegetable or whether or that's an animal. Yeah. And and just how they could, you know, talk about the loaves and fishes, 
I mean, man, oh man, they really know how to do that well. And as you say, we live in such a high wastage environment where we don't want, we cut the fat off and we trim it to this. And, you know, it's hardly recognisable in the end, as you say, where it really came from. So I think it's a really good point. Yeah, and you mentioned, you know, not wasting fruit and vegetables either. I mean, you've probably seen the big, beautiful pomelos in, in Vietnam and the ladies driving around on their bicycles selling them. And you'll see the skin curling around the handlebars. And that's for hair washing. So that's not being wasted. So taking the, the peel of citrus fruit, drying it out, because you've got all those beautiful oils in there, and uh, taking that home and using it for hair washing or selling it, you know, having a second dip in something and, and selling it to someone else for hair washing. So, yes, no wastage. And I think um, one of the other uh, things I'd like to mention at the markets, which I found fascinating, was uh, making noodles. Yes, the noodles are fantastic. And, yeah, and tell us a little bit, Tracy, about why are their noodles better than ours in the sense that they don't kind of clog up my gut like uh, noodles at home. Talk to us about that. Okay, noodles in Vietnam have a shelf life of three hours. They're only oh, fresh wow. for three hours. They don't throw them away after three hours. Again, no wastage. Um, they will sell them cheaper. They might have them themselves for lunch. So you don't work on that one delivery a day or a week or whatever that we often operate here. You get two baskets of noodles and that's for, um, you know, for your breakfast that, for your breakfast tray, and then you get another delivery coming through a couple of hours later with uh, with your noodles for your lunch tray. So nothing ever sits. And when you go there, you can actually touch the uh, baskets that the noodles are in, and they're still warm. They're being delivered mm. um, from the noodle village into the markets, and they're still warm. And when you go to a, a good little street vendor, You'll see motorbikes coming in all the time with fresh noodles. And you, you see the motorbikes around town. They might have um, five baskets on the back of the motorbike all stacked up on top of each other with the fresh noodles. And unfortunately, we just don't get that freshness here. Yeah, it's just uh, I, I, it was one of the things I first noticed, and, and in particular in Hoi An with the, the dish cow lao, which has got noodles and one of my faves, uh, the noodles just, are they still made from wheat? Are they still wheat-based or uh, is it well, rice flour? Well, it depends flour? what noodles you're talking about. Um, the most common noodle would be pho, bang pho, which is what goes into the, the famous soup. And they're a flat rice noodle. Bun is another one. And that's a smaller, rounded noodle, and that's for your char, which you say you grill um, pork belly and pork rissoles. And <laughs> rissoles is a word. Um, and uh, and they're made from rice, but it's a ferment. But the rice is a little bit fermented. Um, so the majority, I would say, ninety percent of the noodles are rice. There is a there is a little bit of wheat noodle, and then of sorry, then of course there's um, cellophane noodles, which is what you put in a fried spring roll, or you'd have maybe in certain other soup dishes, and that's made from some sort of starch. So that could be cassava, it could be a, normally it's some sort of root of a tropical uh, plant. Right. So if you have gluten intolerant people on a tour, where what, what dish would you steer them to then? For travelling and being gluten intolerant in Vietnam is pretty easy. Um, it's, it's most of the food, well, the staple in Vietnam is rice, rice and fish sauce, and they're going to appear on every table. And... So, you know, you're pretty good with that. There's, you know, there's the bung mees, of course, for breakfast or, you know, as a snack, but so, you, you know, just stay away from the bung mees. But there's so many other other options. There's so many varied rice dishes, noodle dishes. Every village has its own kind of 
noodle dish or every region has its own noodle dish that you have to try. There's not a lot of soy sauce used in Vietnamese cuisine. So, again, if you're gluten intolerant, it's not like going to mainland China where it's kind of appearing everywhere. My sister's gluten-free and she visited quite a lot and it was never, never an issue. Never an issue. No, and I think that's good to know. So what would be typically some of the dishes you would learn to cook well, in, in a class? Okay. Well, we mentioned banana flour. Yeah. So yeah that's, talk, that's a, talk a little bit about that. It's, well, it's a very popular yeah. one, delicious. Well, I run a um, – I talk about banana flour. Yeah, well, banana flour is just absolutely beautiful, um, beautiful long purple bell shape. And as you peel off the outer layers, you can see what would become the banana, the hand of bananas underneath. Um, but they're immature, so they're generally not eaten. Um, and you, you discard those and then you get down to where the petals start becoming less purple, a little bit more beautiful golden colour. And then you take those petals and you thinly slice it, as thin as you can get it. You see the ladies in the market doing, and they do it with a knife, no chopping board, straight into um, water with a bit of acid. Um, but chop it as finely as you can get it. Put it in some water with a little bit of uh, lime juice or some vinegar, and that just washes off the sap because you'll feel your, your fingers are quite sticky. Um, and it also softens it a little bit and stops it going brown. The, 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 it will start to brown a little bit in the same way a banana does once it's cut. And then um, depending on what you want to put with it, uh, it could be some carrots and bean shoots. And, again, there's all sorts of regional differences, um, quite often prawn and pork, but there's a beautiful vegan one where you use tofu and fresh lime to make the dressing. Um and, yeah, that's – and if you're doing a classical one, you'd use a, a fish sauce based dress. So, I mean, I, uh, I'm i a bit cheeky as far as uh, when I go to source a cooking class in Vietnam, and, I'm, and I guess that's because I've done a few by now. So if I see in the list of things that they're going to make that mm. it's got banana leaf, mm. I kind of go – Mm. No, I think I've done that about three or four times, so I think I've yeah. got that one down pat. So, I mean, can you yeah, – how selective should you be? Should you kind of look at the menu each time that they offer or, or they say that they're going to cover in the class to see that one, you know, that would be definitely a good class to do versus yeah. another one? A lot of cooking schools or some cooking schools will have – different menus they offer at different times of the day or on different days. So I'd look at that and maybe when you're planning your schedules, have a look. And we used to do um, six different classes. We would offer six different classes. And, um, yeah, if you've With done six the... six different menus? Six different menus, yeah, yeah. Right. And, uh, and this is when you were doing these in Hanoi? Yeah, yeah. And a very good friend of mine's when who I think you know too, Kerry, she does yes. amazing cooking classes and I know she has a couple of different menus and is very happy to um, adjust them or, or um, you know, cater to people's tastes and requirements. So, yeah, just find out what's on offer. Um, we used to have, when I was in Hanoi, we would have six different classes. So we would have a street food class, food from Hanoi, uh, a vegan class, a... One just about spring rolls, a seafood class, and a food from Huey class. So, which is the world? Oh, that's today. a good variety. Yeah. That's so we would. Yeah. So you could just look at the website and choose which which one on a particular day you might want to do, and perhaps if someone if it's already locked in to do a food from Hanoi, people will often say, okay, well, that's the day I'll go to the mausoleum or I'll go up to Sapa and when I come back, that's when you're doing your vegan class. So, yeah, look around and see see if, if there are different classes on offer from the one I think that's place. that's a really good yeah. – that's a good point. So we've, we've kind of mentioned a little bit about the locations as in – 
uh, and your suggestion, I think, to do a cooking class in each location mm -hmm. uh, that you visit, I think is a definite great idea. But talk to us a little bit about just what those differences are. So what, what's the difference between, you know, something that you choose to eat in Hanoi versus Hoi An sure. or versus Saigon? So okay. give us some examples well, food, well, there. food in Vietnam is very regional. Uh, what is consistent throughout Vietnam is the concept of five flavours. So a Vietnamese meal needs to be a balance of sweet, salty, spicy, sour and bitter. So not in every dish, but, you know, in the five dishes that are making up that meal, those flavours should be present somewhere. One or two might be more at the front, like it might be more salty with the fish sauce and more chilli, but the other things might be there in the background, like a bitter leaf, it's part of the salad mix. Um, so that's consistent throughout. The use of rice and fish sauce is consistent throughout. In fact, if you uh, if a child sneezes in Vietnam, you say rice and salt. Good health. If you've got those <laughs> two things, you will survive. Um, in the north, there's a, a winter cuisine. It gets quite cold in Hanoi in December, January. People can often be a bit surprised when they get off the plane. It's very much like a, a Melbourne winter, but it is short. It, it only goes for about two months. Um, so the food reflects that. There's a lot of heartier dishes in the north. For an example, the, the spring roll that's very common in Hanoi is poached seafood bound with mayonnaise, in a rice paper wrapper, egg and bread crumb and fried. So it's picking up a bit of the French tradition. It looks like a little croquette. It's got the mayonnaise in there. Um, and that's that's perfect sort of winter food. Um, there's also the use of, uh, well, there's more Chinese influence in the north because of the proximity to China. And I suppose in some ways it's a little bit more austere. Um, you know, Hanoi is not too showy, you know, it's it's kind of a quieter, quieter sort of place, I think. A bit more conservative. Went. Yeah, it's like Sydney, Melbourne, you know, it's kind of, you know, Sydney's beautiful and it's out there and it, it's great and that's kind of Saigon and, and Hanoi, you've got to kind of look for things a little bit more, but it's all there and it's it's a, a treat if, you know, when you get to, to, to find that and explore that. Um so when you get down to the, the centre, a little bit more of the Thai influence coming in, again because of the, the proximity to Thailand. So more lemongrass, more chilli, the food gets a bit hotter around Hoi An. People often prefer Hoi An food because it's probably more similar to what they've had back home. They're probably a bit more familiar with Thai food than they are with, with Vietnamese apart from, you know, pho. Um, and as you get further south, you're getting more of the tropical fruits coming into it. So a, a fruit can be used either to sweeten a dish uh, or it can be used to, if it's an unripe fruit, it can be used to sour the dish. Um, and then we've got a lot more use of coconut milk down south. And then when you get down around the Mekong, you're picking up a lot of those Khmer and Malay spices coming into it. So the chicken curries that you might have had you know, at back in Sydney or Melbourne or Brisbane or whatever, um, they're generally from, from down south. But it's all delicious. And <laughs> it, it is all delicious, yes. Uh, I, don't, I don't think I've had a bad meal in mm. Vietnam. I, mm. I really don't. Uh, and that's, that's a rarity, I think. Um, well, you know where to go. To say that. Carry, so yes, I, I suppose I have a bit of an inside running and... You know, and for people listening, I'm hoping to give them the inside running yeah. too so that yeah. they can come away yeah. uh, with a great experience. So when we talk about some of the cultural aspects of uh, food and cooking in particular, and I think you and I both agree that uh, a great way to learn about uh, Vietnamese and uh you know, just some of their cultural history is through their food. Mm. You and I the other day were talking about some of the funny cultural things to come out of what, you know, and I think there was an egg story. Do you want to start with the egg story about the O? Uh, yeah, so Zero? if you're taking your child to school you don't, and they're going to be sitting an exam, 
you don't want to give them a hard-boiled egg on that day because an egg is shaped like zero and you don't want them to get zero and that would be bad luck. But, you know, that's that might be strange to us. But when I was in Vietnam and we used to make hot cross buns every Easter for the expat community, um, the Vietnamese staff would just, what, what is this you're putting on top of it? What is the cross um, and why are you doing that? So we have our own kind of... We do. We strange do. traditions, but I suppose in Vietnam it, it, it is linked more to culture and traditions and, the, and the, the diet are all very, very linked. So foods are either hot or cold, not the temperature, but what it does to your body. So if you've got some sort of skin allergy, your blood's too hot, so you need to have foods that are going to cool down your blood. And that's kind of just ingrained in a lot of people in Vietnam that, um, they kind of just know that they grow up, grow up with that. But yeah, wonderful food traditions. Don't eat duck on the first of the lunar month. That's very unlucky. Not for the ducks, obviously, but for, uh, <laughs> but for very unlucky for ducks. Yeah, yeah. Um, and maybe these things were originally about breeding cycles. Uh, these traditions, in the same way, you know, in Europe there are different. Historically, there have been different things you eat on different days and or don't eat at all. Um, so I think that it probably related to, to perhaps breeding cycles at some point, but it's become part of the, the culture and the traditions. Um, there's another great one that I love, and particular day of the year, you eat fermented sticky rice, and it just suddenly appears and it's everywhere and you have to eat it on that day. And that gets rid of any worms you might have, intestinal worms. And I don't know whether it worked, but I certainly ate that fermented sticky rice on that day every year because it links you in, it brings you part of the community. It's something to do together. I mean, sharing food is such a, a beautiful, beautiful thing. And who am I to question whether it works mm, or not? Exactly. Yeah. And I I I really love the reverence they have for food. They kind of treat it with respect. They uh use it uh, as a means as you say to bring people together, to share. They they're always so welcoming. So no matter what there is on the table, if someone comes in, they'll always make room yeah. for uh, you know for you to join them and and I've had that experience many times and just overcome with their generosity yeah. Yeah. when well, there is that. they yeah, sorry. have so little sometimes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um, there Absolutely. is a greeting in Vietnam, which is have you eaten rice yet, that most people probably know anyway, and that's really saying are you being taken care of, are you nourished? And I used to find that really weird when I first lived there and it's like why are you asking me all the time have I, and it's not have you had breakfast, it's have you eaten rice because rice is central. Um, and, yes, it is It is very important, plays an important part. There's certain dishes you will put on your altar at certain times of the year. Um, and then that old, the food from the altar, of course, is always eaten and it's very special to have that food from the altar. So if someone takes an apple from the altar and gives it to you, even if you don't want to eat that apple, that is such a beautiful, generous gift and they're passing on any good luck to you that you take take that apple and I would eat it, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, of course there's special food that comes out when they celebrate Tet, isn't there? Yeah, so Tet's the, the Lunar New Year, most important uh, holiday in Vietnam and the most important food item for Tet is the bang chung, which is sticky rice cake, but in the centre of it, it has mung bean and pork. It's wrapped in leaves and then it's cooked and it has to be cooked over flame. It can't be cooked on electric cooker. It can't be cooked gas. It has to be a wooden fire that it's cooked under for about nine hours. So generally... Everybody has a role, like the children in the family will wash the leaves, um, the, the women would wash the rice, the men would cut the pork, 
and then it's assembled and generally they will you make you know, 20 of them. It's a bit like, you know, your auntie who was in charge of the Christmas puddings for the family and she'd make, you know, 10 of them and give them out, um, spread them between the family. It's same like that with the bang chung. So, some, so somebody would be in charge of that and as you're riding around Vietnam on your motorbike a few days before um, Tet, you'll see lots of big pots out on the footpath or on the road with the wood underneath and people just sitting around watching the, the Bang Chung um, cook. And that's probably the most important uh, dish, but um, it's also one of the reasons why it is important is that no further cooking is required. So you don't actually want to, you don't want to be cooking on the first couple of days of Tet. So a lot of it you would be preparing before. Um, so you just heat, heat it or not on the day. Yes, and, you know, we won't go too much into Tet and some of the ceremony around the first day and, you know, or, or we won't go too much into that because um, that's that's a whole episode just on its own just to talk mm. about Tet. But what I would like to, to grab you and your thoughts um, and your experience, obviously, in is social enterprise in the sense of uh, the work that you did with Koto and and uh, it, once again one of my favourite places to visit mm. in uh, Hanoi. Yeah, Koto uh, is yeah particularly very special. So maybe for people as a as a great starting point and a means to. I think uh, give back if that's the best way to describe it to Vietnam. I always recommend a visit to Koto, but because you have had such a very big role in Koto, I thought maybe you might speak to us um, a little bit about Koto history and and what Koto's about. Yeah, Koto is an amazing project, training restaurant in Hanoi. Uh, I was lucky enough to meet Jimmy Pham, who's a Cabra Matter boy, a Vietnamese Australian man at that age. At that time, he was only 26, so he was quite quite young. Went to Vietnam as a tour leader, and just met the kids on the street. Started buying them meals and paying for them to go to school. And what they said was, "What we really want to do is we want to work and we want to take care of our family." Um, and he said, well, what do you think we could do? And, you know, like a lot of people, they said, oh, we could run a restaurant. And uh, that's, <laughs> that's where I came in. Um, I, uh, I met Jimmy and heard about his vision and thought he was crazy. And he's like, oh, it'll be okay, Miss Trace, it'll be okay. And, it, you know, there were problems along the way, but it's still going strong. So we, we opened in 2000, we had 17 kids off the street. And Kodo's now recruiting, I think, class 38, and there's about 200 kids going through the program at any one time. Um, and it's a two-year program. They receive a certificate uh, three from an Australian training institution, so it was very important to me that quality training was given. Um, and... They stay with the with the program for two years and cover things like, um, well, a lot of life skills, integrating uh, them back into the community. Sometimes the kids are quite restrained, it's strange from their their families and society. So it's sort of linking them back in. Uh, you know, money management, uh, numeracy and literacy uh, skills. So um, yeah, it's an amazing program. And it's helped, you know, thousands, thousands of kids and their families, you know. I'll, I'll go and visit the families of some of the first and second classes that were my students. And when I first went there, they had a had a dirt floor. And, you know, you go back now and they've got tiles on the floor and they've got, you know, an extra few A real things. bathroom. and Yeah, yeah, all that sort of stuff. So, so it's an amazing program. So, yeah, when you go to Vietnam... Um, make sure you go there. It's open for breakfast, lunch, dinner. You can go for a coffee. 
you can go and have a bit of, you can, you're can. you missing a lamington. I know they make lamingtons there. So you can go and have, <laughs> yes, they have do. A, yeah. it's, it's great for kids. So, you know, sometimes you're a bit exhausted after travelling, you know, if you've made your way up from the south and you're loving Vietnamese food but the kids are getting a bit, you know, restless and you want to take them somewhere with that great energy from youth um, working at Koto plus be, then being able to have you know, a toasted sandwich perhaps or a bowl of pasta, or, you know, just settle them down a little bit. So, yeah, it's a, a great spot. Yeah, and as you say, the food's good, the service, um, when you understand the history, you know, the people that are serving you uh, are really doing it from their heart and you know that um, as a student they're in a learning kind of phase. But the whole vibe, the whole energy of the place is always divine and uh, as you say, if you want a, a bit of a treat that reminds you of home or you're a little bit over rice or or noodles etc you can definitely get um mm. some of those home treats yeah. and your Tracy, money is supporting um kids uh, going through the program exactly and that's the other tick 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 as far as i'm concerned tracy look uh i could sit and chat with you for hours about uh, this subject but um i know you're a busy lady uh, i'm going to put some links to your restaurant uh and your cooking school uh, in uh, in Melbourne, the Brun- Brunswick Kitchen. Yeah, that's it. And uh, so uh, everything will be there for everyone that uh, wants to uh, get in touch with you and maybe uh, attend one of your classes because I know that would be fabulous. I know you're an author, so we're going to put links to your book uh, and uh, I've also got a copy of that, which is most handy uh, at times. Lovely to have you on the show. Really grateful for your time, your expertise and knowledge. Thank you for listening. Check out the episode notes for more information. What about Vietnam? Don't forget to subscribe, rate and review and stay tuned for more fun adventures in Vietnam. What about Vietnam?